And some of you will remember, this session was held as a major concurrent session of the 2017 National Housing Conference in Sydney. And received su such a strong response that we decided to elevate it to a further session this time around. And I can tell you the convenient line of senior policy leaders from nine governments, every state, and territory, and the Commonwealth. There's no easy task, so I thank all of our panelists for joining us today. It promises to be a fascinating discussion as our policy leaders outline some of the most successful initiatives in their jurisdictions, as well as debating some of the big policy challenges that we face across the nation. And to wrangle this large panel, I'm delighted to welcome our facilitator for the session, Peter Mears. Peter wears many hats, most recently as the author of his latest book, No Place Like Home, in the Pan Australia's housing crisis, where he's used research and interviews to examine some of Australia's housing challenges and present some more solutions. Peter worked for 25 years as a journalist and broadcaster with the ABC, and now is lead moderator with the Cronulla Centre for Ethical Leadership. Today, Peter will lead this important conversation with our esteemed panel. Please welcome Peter Mendes. me to wrangle these uh, nine people to my right. I'm going to introduce them to you in a moment. I happened to be at that session in 2017 and it was one of the liveliest, I thought, and most interesting sessions of, of that conference. Um, there was a bit of disputation between the states and the Commonwealth. We're in the midst of negotiating, negotiating a new housing agreement. And I, I noticed we unfortunately seated the representative from the federal government right on the end and the states and territories have already made the jokes about shuffling up a bit. Uh, we, won't, we won't let that happen. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce you to the panel in a moment. First, let me make a few overview comments about the state of housing in Australia. And this is very much a big picture view. We've heard a lot today about how different the Northern Territory is from other jurisdictions. Um, we know that the in between capital cities, what's been going on in Perth has been very different to what's been going on in, say, Melbourne or Sydney. But I'm wanting to um, justify why the subtitle of my book is um, Repairing Australia's Housing Crisis, is such a term justified. If we um, could, could argue that for most people, Australia's housing system works just fine. According to the latest survey data, we can see that two-thirds of Australians own their own homes. And although that share of home ownership is falling, uh, the, the value of those homes and the size of those homes is generally uh, greater than in the past. What is more, as a proportion of household income, housing costs haven't changed that much in the past decade. They've hovered around 12 to 30 per cent of income on average. So we could conclude that most Australians own their own homes, their housing is of both good quality and affordable for them. Crisis, what crisis? Or we might say, crisis, whose crisis? Because if we dig into the data, we find that for the poorest 20% of households, housing costs as a share of income has been rising, especially in the last decade, now up to 29% of gross income. And rental stress is on the rise. Not surprisingly, renters in the private market are generally far worse than those in social housing. So this is the average of rental stress for all renters, so it includes people in social housing. If we take the snapshot of people in the private rental market, it's above 50%. So half of all renters in the private market, low-income renters in the private market, are in housing stress. And of course, ha uh, homelessness has been going up. Uh, this has been happening despite the Commonwealth spending more and more on Commonwealth rent assistance. My figure says 4.4 billion. I learned from the conference program it's now 4.6 billion dollars annually. And homelessness has been rising as well. Although the share of rust sleepers has been going down, although there's been improvements uh, for Indigenous uh, Australians, uh, they're still far more likely to be uh, homeless than, than other Australians. Um, and if we dig into the data on home ownership, then of course we can see that um, home ownership, outright home ownership is falling, the number of people still holding a mortgage is rising and there's very new Ahuri data as you will have seen released yesterday showing the increasing numbers of people in that pre-retirement age bracket who still have mortgages um, it's going up and up. So we're going to see more people with higher housing costs um, at, at the end of their working lives. Uh, and then of course we see renting in the private market is going up and this share of social housing, or public housing, uh, is it, it, going, going down. 
And this has profound implications for the future because Australia's aged pension, for example, is predicated on people having low housing costs on the assumption that they own their own homes. But on current trends, more and more will leave the workforce without owning a home. And since there won't be any public housing or social housing for them to move into, they will rent in the private market and the Commonwealth will have to spend an even greater amount of money on rent assistance. And even with that assistance, their housing situation is likely to be precarious and stressful. And the background to this is a rising level of household debt, now about 200% of annual household earnings. The bulk of household debt is housing related either mortgages or for investment loans. Um, and housing is also driving inequality. We talk about generation rent, but there's also generation landlord. That's the flip side. Growing numbers of people with an interest in investment property or rental property and, and strongest growth amongst those who have more than one, two, three, four, five or, or more. So what we're seeing is a change in the uh, distribution of wealth through housing. So this slide uh, shows what the situation was in 2003-04. It shows that the top 20% of households by wealth, then the mean uh, the mean value of their housing was worth 1.3 times the housing owned by the other 80%. So the mean value of the top 20% of their housing, the mean value of their housing is or, or their property ownership is 1.3 times as much as the other 80%. You can't see the bottom quintile there because they don't have any property wealth to speak of. Now we fast forward to the latest data and it shows that that figure is now 1.6%. So we're seeing a, a, a growth in inequality. So we have growing homelessness, growing housing stress, growing inequality and falling levels of public housing and that's why I've used the word crisis. So having painted that somewhat gloomy picture, I'm now going to ask our panellists to cheer us up. And I'm going to ask each of them to tell us a good news story from their jurisdiction. Um, an initiative that's making a difference and maybe has the potential to be expanded or used elsewhere or so on. So I'm going to start with Louise Gilding from the ACT. Louise. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. It's fantastic to be here. I was on the panel in um, 2017 and a lot has happened since then. We have absolutely delivered our housing strategy. It has five goals and it covers the continuum. But the most outstanding thing in that strategy is that we are growing public housing. We're not just renewing it, we're not just recycling dollars from sales, but the ACT government has seen fit to invest in public housing and social infrastructure. And so over the next five years, we will embark on our second stage of um, renewal of about 10% of our properties, but that will also include growth. So I think that's a good news story. We're not even halfway through the conference and we've already heard, I think nearly every speaker has mentioned, there's a gap. When you provide a sub-market rental pro uh, a product, you, it needs to be subsidised or cross-subsidised. So I am absolutely delighted to say that our government has shifted, has changed, has seen fit to invest in the growth of public housing. And I do absolutely think that that is a... Uh, the question was, what could be repeatable? What could other jurisdictions do? I think that could do that. Okay. Louise, <laughs> yes. I'm going to have one very quick follow-up question. So um, I'm going to be a bit pedantic here, but so you're increasing the public housing stock. It, or is it increasing the social housing stock? Is it increasing as a share of all housing? Or is it still going down? It's been going down everywhere. As a share of all housing? Look, I think you need to look at um, is public housing targeted to the whole population, no it's not. Is it increasing as a share of our priority needs cohorts? Absolutely. Does the strategy that I mentioned before in terms of, uh, it works across the continuum. So we actually need to do the heavy lifting across our homelessness sector, across public housing, across affordable rental and across home ownership. And within that strategy, there are other um, significant in uh, in initiatives such as um, inclusion and zoning uh, to actually do the heavy lifting across the continuum. Okay. So our next uh, speaker is, is Jamie Jocker from the Northern Territory. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. And uh, welcome to this afternoon session. You've already heard some of the pressure points that apply to the Northern Territory, and I'll re reiterate some of those now. We certainly have the highest rates of overcrowding in Australia as it relates to remote Aboriginal housing. That's completely undeniable. 
There was a report commissioned by the previous Commonwealth uh, Government that was released in 2017 that identified that to reduce our value to an acceptable level by 2028, 5,500 new three bedroom homes were required and the Northern Territory had more than half that team loan. At that point in time, the Northern Territory Government had already committed their $1.1 billion remote housing program over 10 years and thankfully, just from the shadows of this year's federal election, we were able to secure uh, a new national partnership agreement that saw the Commonwealth match that commitment from the Northern Territory Government. We continue to work in partnership with the Commonwealth to ensure that infrastructure funding is part of that. Uh, when I commenced three years ago, we had 76 available service slots in the remote communities to build new homes. So concurrent to that, we've had an additional half a million dollars committed by the Northern Territory Government to turn on more service slots. We're currently in the plan of an additional 400 uh, on in the very foreseeable future. Uh, however, over the journey of the 10 years, there is still much work to do. We've been heavily focused on rolling out that program. This is targeted towards a social outcome, which is probably the first for any remote housing program that's been delivered. The social outcome focus is to reduce overcrowding, and that need should also provide us a pathway for far greater social influence, and that is in the means of creating Aboriginal employment for Aboriginal people in communities that they are born to, grow and have a future. Unfortunately, the history of remote housing delivery has not ever provided that. We've seen locations have visiting contractors, primarily non-Indigenous corporations and the like, who would come and visit, deliver for potentially six to eight months, generally during the more comfortable weather environment, and then pack up and leave. Stores were not purchased from the local community store. Fuel was not purchased from the local community store. The money was not being invested in those communities. And fast track to 2019 when I was sitting in Manigree earlier this year, a population of some 3,000 people now, one of our sixth or seventh largest uh, towns in the Northern Territory. And I posed the question, how many plumbers, electricians and carpenters live in this community? And the answer was none. That's what we're trying to turn around. And right down the track. And now I'm from Western Australia, very cash. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I can talk to you about uh, a unique initiative that we've got in Western Australia that's the Key Start Home Loan Scheme. Um, it's a low deposit lending scheme that was created 30 years ago, um, and it provides a, a fundamental foundation pillar of the West Australian housing system. Um, providing low deposit lending allows people to get access to home ownership. We have the highest rate of home ownership in the country. Um, we have the highest participation of first home buyers in our housing market in the country. Key Start is a vital uh, tool in and allow our government to apply a whole range of levers to affect the housing market price. Um, it has over 30 years housed more than 100,000 households. It's taken significant pressure off the rental market because without the assistance of low deposit lending, those families would need it to uh, stay in rental accommodation for another eight to 10 years to save the 20% deposit to get a home loan. Um, as you can imagine, um, that takes significant pressure off the, the rental marketplace. Um, the, by linking it with the uh, development activity that our agency's got the benefit of having, um, we're able to align the creation of smaller, more affordable, appropriately sized and amenity dwellings, well located locations to connect people to uh, affordable home ownership through full home ownership, shared equity products, and uh, also embedded social housing opportunities within those developments. So um, through those two elements, the West Australian Government is able to apply some of its unique levers to actually influence the housing market price. Thanks so much, Greg. And um, one quick follow-up question there would be the shared equity models. And some of us are shared equity, so I think the state government takes 25% state often. Is there a risk here then, given property prices falling in WA, uh, quite a long time in Perth in particular? Um, yeah, so there's been significant uh, drops in property prices in Western Australia uh, <coughs> off the back of the mining boom. Um, we don't see it as a significant risk. Um, this is low deposit lending, it's not high risk lending. The credit assessment processes are very robust, more robust than the banks. Um, so therefore, we actually lend to really credit worthy people. The default rate is two thirds of what the banks
advanced experience. So, so really, really good robust processes both in terms of providing the credit, but then also managing and providing hardship support to the clients that do face challenges when they fall into arrears. So um, it's not necessarily uh, an issue of negative equity, more a function of the market, but provided people can service the loan and maintain employment, they can uh, continue to meet their financial obligations. And we know that paying your mortgage happens over 25 years. It doesn't happen over two to three. And by all that, they ask. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, Michael Harkin from South Australia. Uh, thank you. Now, I want to talk about embracing the, um, and recognising that we're participants within the sector as the principal policy lead from a public housing perspective. Um, and a subset of that, I suppose, recognising the CHPs in particular in terms of their role within the housing continuum. Um, the key policy, I suppose, that we've worked on through that process has been focusing on stock transfer. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been working with the CHPs to essentially uh, facilitate the stock transfers on a, basically on three principles. Firstly, on the assets. So designing the transfers to enable them to undertake renewal and redevelopment to essentially give them the certainty through that process um, and, a, and mechanisms that are already designed so they know how they can go about it, know that they're going to get approval through, the, um, through our government processes and at times, depending on the, how the planning systems work, actually support accelerating that development through that process. There's also the second set, which is about the people, the tenants. And, and again, working with our partners, it was about designing the contracts to actually give the public housing tenants the confidence as they were transferring into the community housing sector that you know, nothing was going to change, that they were going to be supported through that process, and that actually the change that we want to work with will be a change that will happen in partnership, will be part of a collaboration and conversation with the tenants. So if we move into new policy settings, both for ourselves as well as the CHPs, that's been done in a, in a respectful way. And then finally, um, the community the, the community development um, emphasis. One of the key challenges that we have as, uh, as large providers, which are typically unfunded to do what we're doing, is we often don't get the time to actually work across the entire community. It's part of the contracts the CHPs are committed to do that, and we're already seeing the benefits from that process. So that's a, that's a core principle now, and a significant benefit in terms of in the background of historic asset sales, declining stock, increasing um, uh, complexity of our clients, so we can actually start to focus on renewing our asset base and also ensuring that we've got appropriate policies to seek our tenants. The second little benefit that was probably an indirect benefit from this was able to turn a lot on ourselves. A, a big advantage about sitting down and thinking about what you would like your partners to do is it gives you the opportunity to sit back and reflect on what you do. Um, gives us an opportunity to think about what we do really well and where there's room for our, uh, opportunity and where there's room for us to improve as part of that process. So that's been really insightful for us as an organisation to sort of move forward. And then I, I think thirdly, the, the aspiration through this is that we don't just think about, you know, this is the beginning um, and, you know, we'll just sit now. It's how do we actually take the philosophy, if you like, of that partnership and that concept of their part of the system rather than being, you know, the public housing system by itself and start to think about all of our providers, the service providers, et cetera, et cetera. Really to recognise that we're a pretty big and slow moving beast. Um, you know, what the, the huge advantage that we have through those partnership arrangements is enabling them to, you know, innovate, take risks, get on with doing different things that, you know, we need piloting that can happen really quickly and then equally sharing that across the rest of the portfolio and uh, across the rest of the system. Right, um, uh, Lyndon Hancock from Tasmania. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll talk about our Better Housing Futures program, which will pick on very nicely from, uh, from Michael's uh, discussion. In 2014, the Tasmanian Government transferred the management of around 4,000 public housing properties to the community housing sector. That represented about a third of the portfolio, so that enabled us to hit the 35% benchmark that had been set. And that was a deliberate strategy to leverage additional funding into the social housing sector and to establish place-based tenancy management models. Uh, it, it wasn't focused primarily on growing the portfolio, uh, although that was a, was a minor outcome from it. So Better Housing Futures portfolio consists of four regional, regionally based uh, portfolios that include broad over suburbs uh, with high concentrations of ageing public housing dwellings. 
Alzheimer's and significant disadvantage. Uh, the, the managing organisations developed master plans in 2017 in consultation with the residents and community stakeholders to improve the amenity and livability of the properties in the areas in general. Uh, the Better House and Futures programs look at a small number of uh, new units of stock, but also very excellent tenancy management outcomes, uh, significant reduction in the deferred maintenance liability, and many property upgrades and new community development initiatives. It's resulted in uh, increased employment and training opportunities in those communities through the community development work that all of those providers have done, and additional supports for tenants. Uh, increased access to healthy food, for example, safer environments, and people reporting increased security and feelings of well-being within their communities. So I think it's, it's been a very successful uh, program from the point of view of tenancy outcomes uh, in moving forward and getting some further asset-based outcomes out of that as well. Thank you. And, and that issue of transferring stock into the community housing sector, maybe the issue will come back to in the, in the discussion. Uh, Chris Hoffman from Victoria. Thanks, Peter. And uh, from a Victorian perspective, I can't help but kind of check in on the Victorian context, just very briefly, but we're now experiencing the, uh, the strongest urban population growth since the gold rush, uh, adding 1,500 people a year into Melbourne. And uh, you know, that equates to something like the population of Darwin every couple of years. So you know, that's the backdrop for us. Uh, the, there's a lack of, um, when you talk about crisis, there's a, there's a real lack of housing affordability um, even at, at every level, um, 5% of our uh, dwellings creating or, or rental um, dwellings creating in the metropolitan building are affordable for those that need it. So, a real sense of crisis. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, the the Homes of Victorians policy of 2016 is a real step in the right direction for us and, and a couple of, I guess, instructive lessons perhaps for others in some of that. Uh, the, the public housing renewal. Uh, peace has, uh, for those who followed that journey, and many of you in this room, uh, has been a, a real lesson in, in how difficult it can be to, to um, garner the support, the, the dollars, but also the community support for the public housing uh, redevelopment on scale in key, uh, key uh, in metro sites. Uh, you know, we've, we've learned the lessons of the different use of the site of public land, the issues associated with density, uh, and, and I guess to some extent the stigma associated with our clients. That said, uh, in the last six months we've now got good packages there, uh, development agreements and, and signs, and we feel like we're over a bit of a hump there in terms of now something that we can demonstrate to government and demonstrate to the community as, as the future of some of that redevelopment and really perspective we hope. I guess the other couple of fronts of, uh, of, of um, um, Future focus and uh, for this room, uh, we, we're increasingly looking at partnership with the community housing sector. And uh, part of uh, Homes of Victorians platform was both a long term billion dollar social housing growth fund, which we could draw down to, to try to provide some of that ongoing certainty, which was talked about in the earlier session. Uh, and, and also, I guess, our, our low cost loans and guarantees to underpin some of that. So, there's you know, there's still um, still some water to go on the bridge to make some of that, um, uh, you know, to realise the impact of some of that, but, but really perspective. And I think one of the things when we talk about positives and reminded this morning in the opening, one of the things that we have done in the last couple of years, which uh, from our own perspective, I think we don't talk about enough, is the transfer of, uh, of properties to our uh, different house in Victoria. Uh, 1,500 properties uh, it represents, in my mind at least, a little bit biased, but probably. One of the bigger things that the government's done in the self-determination agenda, our, our government's committed to a treaty process, is still really tangible first step in, in all of that. So I guess the future for us is yes, there's challenges and some lessons hard learned the last couple of years, but some really perspective um, of options and uh, in front of new investment and new growth. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, Jason Carr from New South Wales. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'll be talking about assertive outreach. Um, in February this year, the New South Wales Premier signed up uh, for the whole of New South Wales uh, to the Vanguard Agreement. It's a commitment to half rough sleeping by 2025. Um, she's also backed that in now as a Premier's priority, one of the 14 priorities of the recently re-elected government, which is both pretty exciting and pretty challenging for the department and for government agencies. It's, it's really a chance to bring together all the old housing agencies and homelessness agencies together with health and justice and the like to really deliver some solid outcomes. 
Assertive outreach is going to be one of the major ways we're um, going to tackle this, particularly initially as we build the evidence space. Assertive outreach uses multidisciplinary teams to go out and directly engage rough sleepers. It's most successfully been used and rolled out in Sydney since March um, 2017. We've actually um, uh, housed 495 rough sleepers since that time, and the, um, the sleep rate after, nine, uh, after 12 months is about 92%, which is very good. Um, we get people who are sleeping rough, we get them appropriately housed, usually in temporary accommodation. We use um, our non-government partners to reach out and connect them with the services they need and then get them into an exit pathway out of homelessness, whether that be social housing, private rental, reconnecting with family or the like. Um, under the strategy, under the New South Wales Homelessness Strategy, which we released in August last year, we've committed to rolling this out in the Tweed area and in the Hunter region. We're also looking at how we can best um, utilise existing resources to build up assertive outreach practices across the whole state. Uh, we're co-designing these practices, we're working with local services, local government, we're trying to adapt them to local needs, there's no one size fits all in this. What works in the inner city isn't going to always work at Burke and it may not be appropriate, so we're really trying to make sure we get the most tailored program we can. And if you want some more information on assertive outreach, I encourage you to attend my colleague Penny Church's session tomorrow um, in the Government Initiatives um, panel. Thank you very much, Jason. And uh, I just want to follow up one question there. Jason, is the biggest challenge uh, uh, for, for you, can I say, is the biggest challenge for you that uh, when you, you do the outreach is actually finding somewhere for people to go? Like, is, is that the biggest blockage then, finding a, a place for someone to live if you it's, want to model it's a challenge, and one thing we've learned from it is we can't be bound by rules and regulations in doing that. We really need to be flexible, um, which when you're looking at some of the traditional bureaucracies, myself included, um, within housing agencies, it's, it's quite hard to step out of the rules and regulations and say this is actually what's appropriate to this individual right now. And if we're going, if you have situations in the past where people go one day beyond their allowance and all of a sudden it's all off, all that support, connection, engagement you have with the client, it's, it's all over. But we've actually recognised that for the long-term benefit, the client may require us just going that extra mile, extra two miles, extra three miles. There are, there are some extraordinary things that um, frontline customer service officers have been empowered to do by the department's executive to get the right solution, and that's, that's what's that's most important. Thanks, Jason. Mark Wall from Greenland. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. So, in 2017, the Queensland Government launched the Queensland Housing Strategy. It was a 10-year vision to fundamentally look at finder access, have people in Queensland as access good, solid, and affordable accommodation. We're uh, two years well into the implementation of that program, and it's really taken a quite a holistic approach. Once, again, it's a very large $1.6 billion capital program to deliver over 5,000 properties of social and affordable housing. But uh, also uh, taking into quite significant issues around regulatory reform. Many people over the years will go through very different types of accommodation, in particular our older Queenslanders. And so for them, uh, significant work happened very early in the piece uh, to make some changes to the Retirement Village Act to ensure that people knew how to get in and what the cost would get into Retirement Villages and also improving their exit processes. That on top of manufactured homes, uh, residential services, and through our Ready in Queensland consultation, we'll soon be the government looking at issues to do with the um, um, RTA Act, um, and then we'll the housing. So once again, from a legislative reform process, trying to look at how we can um, you know, reduce the disputes and, and so forth to be able to improve people's ideas about what type of accommodation they can go into. On top of that, you know, we're really opened up to uh, a broader range of partnerships with industry and bodies, and in a lot of cases, opened up our doors, our policies and procedures to to people to say, look, you know, uh, is there blockages in the way that we've done? And a lot of our programs and policies were great, and they were thought about in the 80s and the 90s and for purpose, but, you know, Queensland and Australia is quite different than that these days, and it's time to be able to take a quite a deal of step back and start to look at what impediments we put in place during those processes. Um, that can now be taken apart, particularly around service models and delivery models for people who locally know what's better to do, and, um, and giving them the freedom to be able to look at what those decisions are and how to use that funding better rather than being um, contracted to a process which has been a... So we're doing a lot of work with the community housing sector, through our partner for growth, the special homeless sector, through our partner for impact, um, working with the real estate industry 
in particular. And an example of Trish trying to also assist people get into the market. And, um, so Tennessee Skills Institute, we've worked with them for some 17,000 people who will train, particularly young people, about tenancy skills. And the real estate industry is quite uh, proactive in, in working with that. Um, on top of that, you know, a, a lot of our work is also to do with service transformation, um, our own public housing that we deliver, um, the way that we deliver that, how we connect it with the, the local community and with the, the local providers is extremely important. Now we're not just thinking about processing applications, we're actually trying to come up with real solutions about how to people as quickly as we possibly can. Um, to do with that, it becomes more targeted service responses uh, for people, particularly when we understand domestic violence. Uh, young people in care, uh, we, we know, you know, a lot of these people we know, we know, how, we know their details, and we've got to be able to get, get trying to get better at, you know, putting the right response around that. Um, you know, but it's, it's also important to make sure that we continue with um, having people sustain a tenancy. So our Q Stars area, and those people like tenancy assistants who will provide that other information, advice, because um, losing a tenancy is quite traumatic, and being able to be able to sustain a tenancy can. Uh, assist people, I've got to do it from a financial perspective, uh, not only that, from a mental and other capacity. So, um, you know, we've stated and said two years into it, we'll be going into a third action, a second action plan next year, and we're hoping that we'll be able to build on all the work that we're doing at the moment, and, uh, and to be able to continue to, you know, uh, change the way that housing has sort of been delivered in the past. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, our final representative, not yet pushed off the event, Phil from the Commonwealth Government. Thank you. Careful what I say now. I um, understand I occupy the spot in a session that was quite notorious in the last um, function, so we'll see how we go. But, um, for the Commonwealth's perspective, I like to look at this. We, we consider this issue both on the supply, demand, and research side of things. So, and in that context, we're looking at it from both the general and the specific. So, if we look at the, the key thing that comes to mind for us, or the key activity that comes to mind to me about what we've done recently that is having a great effect on the market would have to be the NIVIC. Um, now we heard from the Prime Minister, the Minister for Housing and the Assistant Minister today and each one of them mentioned that the role the NIVIC is playing in both unlocking capital. Um, and it's early days but we're going to ask a lot on it. Um, there's the initial bond issuance of $315 million and 29 participants in that. There's the first construction loan to blue chip um, of $45 million. More recently, we've asked um, NIFIC to step up with the um, first home loan deposit scheme and, we've, um, and with $25 million that we've given to do that, it's also undertaking a research function. So from the Commonwealth perspective, the NIFIC is a great opportunity to unlock um, capital, um, aggregate um, the, the funding requirements of the market and see what we can do to, to drive growth finance because for what we bring to the table is that ability to bring finance, the ability to bring funds. We don't have a regulatory function and we don't have a constitutional power, so we're using what we can to make this um, make this as useful as possible. The other thing I'd say about the NIFIC is that it's also an opportunity for the states and territories and industry to work with the Commonwealth in a way that doesn't involve um, having large ministerial negotiations because it can be done in a bespoke way that deals with a particular issue um, on the ground, whether that be a construction project that needs to take place or a funding for a particular organisation to the aggregator. I suppose I'd, I'd close it off, and, and this is in addition to all the other things that we've got on. There's clearly the NAHA, there are the uh, particular pieces of work we've got around the Hobart City deal, the Barclay City deal, the Safe Places program. But really, I said the NIFIC is a, is a game changer in the market. Um, they can take us forward. Now, I'll just reiterate the comments made by Minister Howard earlier, and I think made very bluntly by um, uh, um, Patricia Cabellis, that there's an opportunity at the beginning of the term for the, the government to hear what you want to tell it um, and for it to take things forward. And I'd encourage you to take up Minister Howard and the invitation that he had to bring ideas forward to the Commonwealth that we can, that we can do some good things with. I've heard some very large numbers today um, about what we need to do. I agree with Wendy that we shouldn't shy away from the size of the issue that we're wrestling with. But to put it in context, the Commonwealth defence budget is $32 billion. When we've modelled some of this, we've had numbers coming up at $22 billion a year. Now, don't shy away from it, but I think if we're going to ask for that kind of funding, we need to make that case and we need to make it very, very well. Um, and the research function of NIFIC is going to go some way in making sure we can, um, we can achieve that. 
Thanks for much, Randy. Now, now I'm going to engage, the rest of our time will be engaging our panellists in conversation. <laughs> questions from me, questions that you've submitted in advance. Later we'll have roving microphones to get questions from the floor as well. But I invite you to get your little app thingies out now because we've got a, a live polling question that I want to ask you. So um, go to the polling section of your uh, mobile device. Um, and the, there are, uh, the, the question that I, I'd like to ask you is this. What should be the primary aim of government housing policy? Should it be A, to increase, we're going to get the, the slide up here too for this one. Um, so, what should be the overall aim of government housing policy? Should it be to increase overall housing supply? To increase rates of home ownership? To provide secure housing for the most disadvantaged? Or to shape a productive and sustainable city? So those are your four options. I invite you to start voting now. Social dollar that should be being 
pointed to alleviating the significant disadvantage that we face is actually going into a commercial profitability, be it through paying travel allowance and or transport costs. So that's the tyranny of distance that we face here. But overall, you then have to look at the territory again in its totality. We, as a government, already provide housing to over 27% of the Northern Territory's population. That exceeds every other jurisdiction by a significant uh, way. So on the basis of that, there's a lot of work still to be done. Okay, any, any, other, any other comments on this topic? Probably the final one. Uh, I think you need a range of interventions across the, the housing continuum. I mean, supply and targeting uh, to areas or to the cohorts of disadvantage is certainly a big part of it. But if you're looking at the housing continuum, you need to have a range of interventions that are trying to move people from the left hand side of that continuum as far across to the right uh, as those individuals can go. So I think that, that breadth of, of policy discussion uh, is critical. In terms of moving it forward. Okay, I just, just last one. I'm really just access to a stable home is most important. That people get up to be able to get other agencies, other people to be able to assist people with support, and to be able to wrap around the service if someone needs kind of mentally. So, yeah. So access to a stable home. I mean, my, my observation here would be that you know because most Australians are homeowners, that drives the media coverage, it drives the politics, and we see uh, a lot of effort going into supporting people getting into home ownership. And that, there's always an opportunity cost. I mean, I think Patricia said earlier, you can have aspiration, you can have fairness. Well, no, maybe you can't. Maybe there are trade-offs here. That's, that's my observation. I don't any further comments you're welcome to make, but otherwise I'll move the topic on. Brendan, do you want to come on? Sure, go on. Uh, go. Um, when I'm, I'm not sure about the questions, but I mean, when I think about this as an issue of housing, for, um, home, housing affordability, so, and that includes about having you know, homes in the right places for people where the jobs are going to be. So when we think about our key workers, alleviating pressure on that as a continuum so that those who need the homes can have them and that we can then redirect the yeah. services to where they need to be most because um, Lyndon's exactly right. These bespoke problems throughout the continuum and a solution on one end is going to be the same for one or the other. I mean, more broadly, um, I think that the housing affordability question is it, it's going to have a longer term problem when it comes to things like implications for the age pension and, and other things when we, we've got a system that's predicated on the basis of you're going to own a home and if you're going to go on the age pension that will cover the costs that are outside of um, home um, or, uh, housing costs. So then we have CRA applying at that end as well. So it comes down to an issue of affordability and what's affordability is going to have to include where the um, premises are, the locations that they are, um, which is co-located where the jobs are for the people who need them. But since you've raised CRA, I wanted to ask a question about that. What, what are the projections for spending on CRA into the future on current trends? Because we, we've seen that new data from Ahuri showing how many people are still carrying mortgages into retirement. We see the falling home ownership rates. We see demographic ageing. That suggests there's going to be a much bigger demand for CRA into the future. Um, I'm, I'm aware of the, the numbers that Ahuri's put out. Um, they're not things the government um, projects as such because these are welfare Missing welfare payments, much, much like some of the other welfare payments that we have. Um, but when it comes to CRA, one of the things in my mind is that I mean, the Commonwealth is going to have an increasing um, CRA burden um, with the transfer of stock and community housing um, from, from social housing. And, and that's okay, I think, so long as we can make sure that we, uh, we get the best outcome from that. And so this becomes this question about well, if, if title goes with the property, or with longer term leases at a bank and will it can be used to finance the community housing providers, then that's probably, a, you know, that's not a bad outcome for us to um, consider. But where we don't have that, we're kind of getting the, the worst of both worlds. The cost of being more like Commonwealth and the community housing provider doesn't have something to take to the bank to, to back engineer. Then I'm, I'm questioning if we're getting the right outcome and the, the right benefit out of that system. Okay, well that goes to another topic I wanted to raise because it came up in several of the initial uh, responses to, to things that are happening and, and in several jurisdictions it was talked about the transfer of state authority stock, public housing stock into the hands of community housing providers. So is it accepted that this is the best way to go? Is, that a, is there a view, a common view across all states and territories that this is the future? We have a target of right now 35% of, of our stock being with community housing providers. 
um, this is the, uh, in, in New South Wales, so it's a very large amount that, um, that will support the growth of the community housing sector. Obviously, one of the reasons that we do that is to attract CRA payments into a system that many people regard as fundamentally unsustainable. Um, with the extra CRA, you are able to provide extra maintenance and long-term asset spend, and you're also able to provide additional tenancy management. We don't see it as the only option, but we certainly see it as part of a, a market in which we can commission services from public, community, and private suppliers. Um, and one of the one of the interesting things that we're trying to do now is working with on, um, the NIFIC and, and also talking with other jurisdictions as well about how best. What, what is the best length of contract um, to have management transfers for, or is title transfer the best thing to do in certain geographic areas, and how can we get the most uplift? Um, and you know, is it an answer? It certainly is a very good answer if you look at some of the outcomes from, from the perspective of tenants. I mean, tenant satisfaction is, seems to be higher for community housing providers. How much of that is that additional funding they're able to attract, and how much is some un other fundamental issue? We're not sure yet, we're still looking. Yeah, so we do see, I mean, in the, in the survey data, community housing tenants report higher levels of satisfaction than public housing tenants, or both are high. But there's still a lot of resistance, at least in Victoria, I can't speak for other jurisdictions, a lot of resistance from public housing tenants to what they see as essentially a form of privatisation of, of, of a state asset. Um, and, and, and so I'm interested, what, what's, the, what's the intent here? Is it really to shift costs to the Commonwealth? Because thanks very much, we don't have to pay for this anymore, or we, we you know, we get the additional benefit of, of Commonwealth rent assistance and a, bit, and a discount on, on uh, capital gains tax. Is that the primary motivation, or is the motivation different? I actually think the motivation is different fundamentally in that we've got to recognise that there's, with the increasing complexity of need that we have, there are certain cohorts. Um, within our society that need special and, and purpose-built housing, they also need wraparound services. They need a number of things that sort of relate to their community um, more broadly in terms of ensuring that they can live successful lives. I think there's a certain an advantage in terms of having a diverse model provider system that can actually cater for different customers better at different points in time. Um, it doesn't mean that they're with them forever. It may mean that they're part of their journey. It means that they'll pass through a couple of different providers on the way through to, um, to really their aspiration in terms of their housing journey. Um, I, I think the, the reality is, is that this is something that we've all talked about, and I, I think obviously it was part of the CHP session a bit earlier, where there's a recognition that this is a huge task. So it's actually going to take all of us um, to play in it. But equally, I think one of the things that's really important as part of this is to recognise the interrelationship in the housing continuum. Um, the advantage that you get with having that diversity of providers means that there can be some that can focus further up the chain in preventative type housing, which can also provide more journey related activity. It means that they may have the ability economically to deliver a supply which isn't as available because the funding's not there to provide support for them with the, the, the more complex tenant as part of that process. So now I think the response is actually going to come down to what are the levers at the point in time. I, I think I go back to that question before around the housing strategy. I think what we're really needing is a longer term plan around saying this is what the levers are going to be for a period, a decent period, a 20 year period that actually starts to match the cost of the investment in the asset with the likely funding sources that are going to provide for it. That way that the sector, both the government, the non-government and private sector can arrange themselves to ensure that they can be most efficient, most effective in their part of the, that quadrant. Um, for the Territory, this is very much a social opportunity, particularly as we talk again about the remote housing environment. So uh, Aboriginal housing is very much the future that we're trying to aim towards. It's the benefit of having a 10 year uh, plan in place where there's some sustainability of funding coming through. There is a significant focus on trying to transition to community control and ownership and it's readily apparent that the CHP model does provide a pathway for Aboriginal enterprises to be able to do that. The social flow of that, of course, is that if we can get to that point in time, those entities themselves will be able to employ people in community, then create hopefully an economic basis, not only from their real estate uh, portfolio in the future, and what they may be able to do commercially, depending on uh, change in legislation in the likely future, but also actually create a true viable pathway of employment for the full, full period of a person's life in a remote community that they're born. 
Thank you. I said at the um, session before this on the, um, with the community housing providers, and fantastic session. And I would have to say, it's not either or. It's not public housing or um, community housing. And there are more ways to grow community housing than public housing stock transfers. So back in 2007-2008, the ACT government set up a significant loan facility and set up our community housing provider um, for the ACT with specific targets. So there was low cost loan, there was inclusion rezoning, there was land rent. And bringing those things together has meant that we've actually grown community housing, but not at the expense of public housing. does seem to be an increasing tendency of states to, you know, they're setting targets 35%, why 35%, will it go to 50, will it go to 60, I mean, is there, a, is there a logic and a reasoning here about the right mix between community and public housing, that's what, that's, I guess what I'm, I'm asking, Greg. Uh, I think that what you're hearing is collectively the view of the senior officials across government is that it's the complementary nature of the system. Um, if we, if we get stuck in an argument and a debate about the existing portfolio of public housing assets and how to best use those to zero sum game. If we actually work on saying how do we now grow the portfolio of social housing stock that includes public and community housing, well we need to be talking about how do we get the next 100, 150,000 dwellings into the system, not the existing ones we've got, who's best place to manage them. Then what we will see over time, as Michael points out, is people starting to play to their strengths. And then naturally, the movement of stock and resources can go to those best places to deliver the outcomes that we're looking for. Yeah, Chris, you want to come to the And you mentioned, I think you alluded to this being a bit tricky in Victoria, or perhaps that's, that's what I heard. I, look, I, I think, echo the comments of others, you know, that absolutely this needs all, all players to lift. Um, the public housing system needs to lift. We'd, we'd love to help community housing to lift more. Uh, management transfers, your question was what's the purpose of management transfers? Is it getting it kind of off the books or is this some other intent? Well, you know, I think to channel our minister a little bit, he would say it's, it's absolutely about what's the intent. Is, are we seeing management transfers that translate into growth? And if we can be convinced of that, then, then um, very much, um, you know, uh, a lot to it. And we have a 4,000 management transfer target, uh, but increasingly, as our minister comes at that target, his, his, um, his mindset will be you know, showing the outcome for that transfer. Now that may be growth or it may be, as we've seen, the AHV transfer, a transfer for, for a certain purpose, uh, but, but you know, this kind of packages for purpose is, is certainly his own. The other bit is that um, you know, community housing sector is well placed to deal with the flexibility as people move through the continuum. Um, so that you know, we build, try to build a, a set of portfolio that doesn't rely on government as much with it and also allows people as they move and get high paid jobs and whatever else not having to move house but able to be able to change flexible rents and get into market rent and get to the home ownership and I think that's again it's a different opportunity between public housing and community housing how that can be best suited. Okay so so um, one of the this is a question was submitted by a, 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 someone in advance of, of the, um, the session and You've all spoken about engaging with communities and with tenants to ensure their interests and concerns are heard and incorporate, incorporated into policy and so on. But what happens if policymakers, you guys here and, and your ministers, have a different idea about what is good from the tenants? As I say, in Victoria at least, there are public housing tenants who are very resistant to the idea of stock transfers, very resistant to the idea of public housing renewal programs. Um, now, they might be wrong, but, um, um, you know, consult with and, you know, where, where's the balance between consult with and listen to and uh, when there's a conflict between what the government wants and, and what the tenants or the communities want? Or is it always, happy, is it always, always come out happily? That's what I think we heard this morning as part of the keynote uh, speaker. It's, you know, the onus is on us to be able to tell the story, and to be able to tell it sufficiently well that, you know, people can actually and you can grab hold of that, own that, and understand that as part of the process. Acknowledge entirely that, you know, some people's unique in, in circumstances make that idea of actually thinking about the whole um, a very difficult thing to do. But again, I, I keep getting back to the, the, the reality of the stock transfers that we went through the process of, you know, we, we started with a huge amount of, um, of uh, this 
quite in the tenant basis and slowly but surely with the relationships building with the, the providers that we were working with, us working with them, made them feel really comfortable. In the end, out of the 4,000 we worked through, we ended up with a handful, less than a handful, that were really, at the end of the day, just a conscientious objector. You, could, you couldn't actually have a, an argument one way or another that was going to support it. It was just a, a philosophical view. Others could see the benefit once you spent their time to tell the story. So I think to me it is actually about getting down and really describing the why. Why are we doing this? But, but you telling the story, I don't want to get stuck here, but you telling the story is different to you hearing what tenants have to say. No, but I think that that's, I think, I think you have to listen to what we're saying. What we have to do is actually listen to go out and work with the community, work with the providers, actually share it together. So the policies and the programs shouldn't be developed within the ivory towers. I mean, that's the primary change that we're really trying to drive through, which is how do we work with the sector, how do we work with the community at large, how do we work with specialist providers, help their mind and shape those elements. So the story is actually, how do they know that the story works, is when they can hear their words back in it, they can feel their commentary through that process. I think change is always difficult, but we've got to remember that this is about people and it's about choice. And so, several years ago, as part of uh, transitioning to the NDIS, we had a community housing provider who provided a lot of our disability housing um, who were no longer able to do that. And we worked with the tenants, with the advocates, with the guardians, with the carers, and we also worked with another community housing provider. And we provided each person, each tenant with choice. And we said, you can choose to go with another community housing provider, or you can actually choose to um, come back to public housing. And as part of that listening process, the majority actually chose to go with the new community housing provider. But there were some um, that wanted the safety net and the security of being in public housing, as they saw it. So I think one of the one of the frames that we're and one of the kind of policies that we're very keen to uh, adopt around our tenants is the kind of social landlord city, uh, where we you know and there's a number of components to that. We, our housing workforce kind of lift to be better tenants and property managers. Uh, nested within DHHS, we kind of try to get the, the system, the service system to come and play better in, in pockets of the disadvantaged, and we do some of the place-based renewal, the neighbourhood renewal. Piece and, and do that well, and increasingly, you know, that's our frame for managing uh, the tenants in, in our public housing. And, and I think part of that social landlord inherent in that is, you know, a social landlord doesn't just boot you out. So, you know, it, it is absolutely, you know, the kind of NDIS frame of choice and control is, is not one that we've kind of uh, adopted as such, but it's, it's part of our thinking around uh, working with communities. Uh, on options for them and trying to you know, to try and provide pathways through what fair to say is a pretty constrained housing system. It's, it's not like we have, despite the myths that are out there, it's not like we have a lot of underutilised stock that we can easily move people into. So yes, there's constraints, but you know more and more we're, we're very conscious of that. We did lose hearts and minds through our public housing renewal program by not doing some of that and and, uh, and have learned those lessons we hope. I think, um, I start thinking about nearly everyone around the place, I know I've had anything else, has always gone against the rocks at some stage and asked a question and got told, so the system says no. But we had no idea what was ruled, what the decision was, and what was something you know, written by a year ago, 20 years ago. So having diversity of views and being that forward you know, should be encouraged because I think there's another way that we can't change uh, you know, the, the system itself, we actually don't realise that sometimes all our rules and regulations are just quite obviously burdensome and actually don't make any sense in today's world. So, you know, by doing co-design and collaborating a bit differently with people, putting out what the issue is and saying this is the issue we've got to find, we don't know all the answer, but this is the issue we've got to help, how can you help us resolve this, is a great way of getting more people to be able to find it. actually need to be upfront about what the challenges yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, government's role in this space is always going to be trying to be the honest broker of the conversation in the first instance, and then it's got a vested interest uh, in the subject matter as well. So I think it really is about the level of sophistication and how you actually structure those consultations to ensure that, yes, uh, the elements of government that the subject matter experts will have, have a degree of expertise in the space and the ability to feed into that discussion, but also then that has, has equal weight, no, no greater weight, but equal weight without the voice of the sector and other interested state it's that balancing wearing those two hats that I think we still need to do some work on. Okay, I'm going to ask.
ask a question and I'd like you all to respond to it a bit, and I'll start at the end with, with, with uh, the federal government. And it, the, the context is this, we all know that the level of social housing, and I'm combining here public and community housing into, into one bucket, so the level of social housing has been going down in Australia. It used to be about 6% in the mid-90s, it's down to around 4% now. Um, Northern Territory is a different kettle of fish as we know, but the level of, of social housing has been in steady decline in proportion to all households. Does your jurisdiction have a target as to how low that should go, or where it should stop, or how high it should go back up to? Like, is there a number you can say, well, 6% should be what we're aiming for, or, you know? So, I'll just... Uh, quite simply, the comment, no, we don't have a number. Um, and I think you heard from Mr Howard this morning, though, that he's open to being... Uh, to hearing on these issues, um, but at this stage, there is no big sum of Mark? Um, again, the issue is that there's no number, but it's about accessing a stable home, and that can come from social housing, community housing, private housing, a level of assistance, helping someone. Okay. So, you know, you can build a whole new estate somewhere or a, a landlocked area, and you're not going to get any social housing into it because of the developer's system, and those numbers might go up. But Again, you've got to make your target where you're going to put your social housing that's near the services that are responsible for the time. So, you know, a site place as large as Queensland with very diverse, you know, regional areas, um, you really have to be looking at it from a perspective of what's going on for that community in that particular cohort. Yeah, take the point. There's no point in just building housing and whacking it anywhere because it's cheap to build there or something like that. But we also know, and I, I, by other responses, I'm wanting to push this a bit. We also know there is a there is a cohort in the Australian population for whom uh, rent in the private market is not vital, and and that is a cohort who relies on, on social housing. And so, what level of social housing do we need to adequately provide for that group? That's that's, or, or do we think about it in those terms or not? social housing strategy has the aim for more social housing. So we do see that there needs to be more than there is currently. But the secondary aim of the strategy is to provide more incentives and support for people to avoid or to exit public housing. So while there isn't a, a, a ceiling or a floor on, on the amount we see, and we, we are putting more out there through Communities Plus and Social and Affordable Housing Fund and other items, um, we don't have a target in mind. And we're keeping to, we're, we're really looking into the cohorts of people who are currently on the housing register and what's the best public support they need to try to understand that a lot more. Chris? So do we have a target? You can just say yes or no. We don't. We don't. <laughs> we don't. Do we need one? Well, possibly. And it would be a very empowering piece in, in, in a number of ways. You know, it's been the sort of thing that a number of stakeholders could unify to understand, unify around to understand this available task. Equally, it allows us to do some of the more difficult things in the context of growth. Um, but, you know, frankly, it's going to be hard for our government to come at a target if we can't show them the path. And, and on the numbers that we're looking at, and the numbers we talked about this morning, you know, we're, we're building hundreds of properties per year in Victoria, and we need to be building thousands year on year. So it's, it's not surprising to me that government's not signing up to a target. And, and I feel like and part of this conversation, part of what, what you know, we need to be thinking about is how do we build faith, how do we build that faith in investing in the system um, building a pathway and showing the government keep a clear, kind of systematic plan for how we're going to close the gap between where we are and where we need to be. And, and, and that target might be a target of saying, well, we can't let it go any lower as well, because the other problem, of course, I mean, we understand that prioritising social housing for those in the most need is, you know, that makes sense, right? But it also results in what, we, what has been called residualisation, increasing <coughs> disadvantage, concentration of disadvantage, and so on, which then make social housing politically very un, 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 unhelpful for the general public. So we get these dilemmas, but let me stop interrupting and <coughs> do you just have Tassie have a target? Uh, Tasmania's got a 10-year affordable housing strategy that uh, stretches from 2015 through to 2025. That's got two targets in it. First is uh, affordable, uh, the action plan number one, 2015 to 19, which was to increase supply by about 450 units of stock. We exceeded that just. Um, we've got a target of just around 600 for the next um, action plan to 2019-23. It's not expressed as a proportion of, of the housing stock, but it has actual, basically, an actual definitive number of targets contained in it that are funded. 
That's a great question, Peter. And the, the answer is Australia Home is no. Um, something that we're churning ourselves in, inside out over through our housing strategy. One of the things that the government did when they came into government was to go and uh, commission a report to find out what housing stress is within South Australia. How many properties, how many homes, uh, how, how many households are actually in housing stress would actually need a supported sum. So we've actually got a, a measure, uh, a number. Um, I, I agree with the comment before, unless you've got strategies, governments are reticent to actually lock down to um, particular elements. But there's another thing as part of this process which is expanding the conversation. Because, uh, the interesting thing, we think about public housing as being the old social housing, but it was probably really the old affordable housing. Um, so a large amount of where our targets, I think, will be will actually be in the affordable housing space, importantly. Because as it is becoming a residualised system, what we've essentially seen is transferred from affordable housing companies, all of us, into essentially specialised and high need housing companies. We've probably still got people that are living in an affordable house within public housing. The question is, do they stay or do they find their way into another form of housing and we continue to increase the population of, of high needs within our, in, within our portfolio? Um, the West Australian Minister for Housing has got an aspiration to maintain our current 4% level. Um, he said the agency a challenge to find ways to identify how we can maintain those levels. That requires us to build a thousand units a year on average and maintain those. Um, we've got a strategy that uh, one of my colleagues is working on at the moment that will look at uh, revamping our affordable housing strategy. Um, but I, I do reflect on Michael's point specifically that the social construct of, the historical construct of what social housing actually is has adapted over time. Um, and we need to be really clear on what numbers we're actually talking, talking about. Probably not surprisingly, our demand environment speaks for itself in respect to that question. But I think what's important to note, if you look at the urban settings of the Northern Territory, we have a way that's of over 4,000 that continues to grow. And as I pointed out before, we're already housing well over a quarter of the territory's population. So that in, in and of itself is a challenge. We also have a declining population at the moment, particularly impacting our capital city. Uh, that's following the oil and gas industry boom that's been up here. What we have though seen is that even though that weight list has grown, we're moving between seven and 800 tenancies uh, transferring out. We've seen a significant increase in access to our bond loans. We've seen uh, a lot more people looking to purchase the home from us. So we have seen that we are getting a bit of a pathway for people. We have also look outside the square of just us being able to provide it. I want to pay particular credit to the Central Australian Housing <laughs> Company uh, who have the My Place initiative down in Alice Springs, where they've actually been creating a pathway, particularly for Indigenous women, to get into the private rental market in Alice Springs, which is uh, no uh, small feat when you consider it's normally one percent vacancy rate in that town and some very entrenched associated concerns. So uh, please touch base with John McBride and find out further about that. Thank you. Um, do we have a, a, a target? Yes, we have a target to grow public housing. We currently have between six and seven percent of the housing stock. Our aim is to have um, a diversified portfolio across all of our suburbs where we have about, again, 6-7% um, public housing in each suburb located close to um, services, transport, jobs. Do we have a target in terms of land release and strategies? Yes, uh, which is, we have a 15% dedicated land release which is um, designed to help the community housing sector grow. Do I want more? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to come to your uh, questions from the floor shortly, um, and we'll do one more little live poll before that. But I, I have one more question before that, and that goes to Nithic. Now, we've heard a lot about Nithic. Um, it's been, I think, generally welcomed as a, a great initiative, the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. Uh, and the first bond was a great success. Um, but my understanding is, and I'm happy to be corrected here, but my understanding is that was partly successful because community housing providers were able to refinance their existing loans and therefore to get a lower interest rate and, and, and so on. To go further, to build new properties, to, to really expand, um, the, the question is, doesn't that actually, as, as we've also heard repeatedly this morning, require consistent, secure, stable, bipartisan funding of the yield gap? between you know, the cost of providing the housing and what the rent can bring in. And that without that, NIFIC really isn't going to live up to its potential. So that would be my 
critique of MIFIC, great organisations need a constant stream of reliable funding that will enable that yield gap to be met. So my, my response would be that um, I don't necessarily disagree with anyway, the way early days for MIFIC. Indeed, most of the 315 mil um, is in refinancing. Um, with those participants. It'll be interesting to see how the next bond goes, and indeed it'll be this audience who can tell us who will have a better idea than I do about whether how they're going to participate in that. I think the, um, the blue chip uh, construction loan is a good indicator that it's going to go further than that, um, and that um, I think we've got some good insights. One thing I'd say though on the, fund, on the, um, the funding gap, or the yield gap though, is that um, I, I understand the issue, I understand the need, I also hear different views put quite prominently and indeed this morning between do we have a funding gap and it's an ongoing subsidy from, the, um, gov from governments to, to fund this or do we need capital investment and what is the most efficient best way to do this? I've heard both put this morning saying capital is the most efficient way for governments to support the, the industry and others saying it's an ongoing funding subsidy. So I think that's kind of a critical thing that we need to penetrate and understand when you want governments to start putting more money into this market. Um, as to which way it's going to be the most efficient, yes, and there's better at the moment. Okay, other observations on the and funding? Dare I be lynched, but I think um, I congratulate the Commonwealth on MIFIC. I think it's a great initiative and a great opportunity for the sector. I think that we need to be cautious about responding too quickly and without allowing the market time to adjust. You know, I, this morning we heard Blue Chip and we heard uh, Brisbane Housing Company looking at ways in which they can maximise their opportunity. I think that um, giving the sector time to consider and work out how it can optimise and structure the way they operate to make use of the available funding is what we need to do. So give it time, allow the market to adjust rather than throw more money at it. Chris, you, what were you, you decided not to say something now. <laughs> Um, I feel like I'm a bit sorry for you, because um, I think it's a good initiative uh, and there's lots of potential as you're saying, but it, it would fall into the trap of that it's one piece in the puzzle that's needed. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's effectively there to, to underpin lines, it's not there to, to fill the, the funding shortfall. As to is it, is it capital or is it ongoing subsidy, well if we're trying to house the most needy people in spot. And and so We've, we've, fallen, we've, we've been caught in this trap with a couple of our Victorian initiatives where they're, they're issues for a certain purpose and all of a sudden they're being criticised for not filling the whole picture, the whole picture of growth. So that's why I feel sorry for a good initiative but it needs all the complementary policies that are out there. I mean, I think one of the questions around is it capital or is it a, the, the ongoing funding of the gap? Part of it is this holy grail of getting super funds investing as well, right? So that's the holy grail. There's trillions of dollars sloshing around there. There's my, I mean, my own super funds, I'd be very happy if it was investing in affordable and social housing. But that's not going to happen until there's a you know, pretty guaranteed return, at least a, a minimum level or something like that. So is NIFIC the key to getting that super fund money into social and affordable housing? My comment on that is it'll, it'll help the transition. So I think we'll actually accelerate the opportunity for alternate sources of finance to actually come in. But fundamentally, residential has been investment grade for a number of really good reasons. And it's not just it's not just the cost of borrowing related to that, it's all the other costs associated which comes from holding residential property, the, the maintenance liability, the rates and taxes, the accounts rate, all of those other things. When you go and buy Telstra shares, there I say, um, you don't actually pay ongoing holding costs for that. So when you actually sit back and you look at the cost of holding residential property versus another residential property, uh, versus an alternative investment product, it's, um, there's a huge gap that actually needs to be bridged. So it, it fundamentally it depends on, on what we're trying to achieve through this process. And, and for me, I, I think there is always going to be a, a funding gap. To think that you're going to get a commercial return, I think maybe a bit bridged too far, is then about well, how do you actually bridge that? How do you remove the risk from the investors? Can we rely on capital return, which has historically been the basis of return within property? Can we rely on that to actually provide? We may need to come up with more sophisticated products which actually guarantee returns over time rather than income returns during periods. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that space, but what NIFIC does do is it continues to provide strength and independence into the sector so that they can continue to move. 
And when the opportunities are up and the policies are up, they're ready to go. Okay, so let's go to one more live polling question and, and then to your questions from the floor. And, and this, um, so get your acts out. And, uh, and this question is, uh, what's the best way to provide secure housing for those on the lowest incomes? Is it uh, to increase Commonwealth rent assistance? Is it to restore the share of social housing to the levels of 1996, say 6%? Is it to just increase the overall housing supply, or is it all of the above? Okay, voting starts now. Uh, New South Wales government was very keen to put that on the table last time and we'll continue doing so. 
so we saw uh, an opportunity to add to the New South Wales contribution, the type contribution, the amount we'd be saving from interest and putting that directly into our stock. Um, while that didn't get up this time, it's, it was a very open conversation between the jurisdictions and I expect it will continue, particularly with the Tasmanian situation. So can I ask, um, from South Australia's perspective, have, have, having the debt, um, having got rid of the debt, has it enabled more spending? Has that money gone into more social housing, more um, life support and so on? Uh, no, it was state in Australia. Sorry? No. It didn't? It didn't at all. Right. Uh. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs>
incredibly improved in some communities uh, that a lot of these organisations, at least in Tasmania, are operating in. And that's driven primarily from the place-based nature of the organisations, and that was tied up in the agreements that we had, that that, that was a mandatory part of the model. But the, the investment, the effort and the connection of the communities that CHP organisations have, uh, have undertaken in Tasmania has really transformed those communities on the ground at a local level. Uh, and that's something that, quite frankly, the, the state housing providers uh, are really not resourced or even structured to do. And I'll come to that when you get to the second part of your question a little bit later around what are some of our policy challenges, because I think there are some very much some learnings uh, state housing authorities can take from their signature partners in that space. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a question over here, I think. Yep, the uh, gentleman there. In, yep. Hi, Cameron Murray is my name. I'm here for Prosper Australia. And my question is, we, in the surveys, uh, we saw that we're, we're talking a lot about funding new supply. Um, in the ACT, they have their own land development agency that can uh, flood the market with as much land as it wants and effectively set the price, but it chooses not to. It could depress the price 20 or 30 per cent. And when I asked the advisor of the Chief Minister why they don't use the powers they already have to make housing cheaper, he said, well, we wouldn't want house prices to fall. My question to you is, if you were successful in boosting the community housing and public housing sector so much that it attracted people out of private rental and depressed private rents and reduced prices, would that be a political handbrake to your agenda? And is that what the real problem is to doing anything of the scale necessary to securely house our most needy? Okay, now I can't see very well. 
Yes, please. Uh, Jeff Larkin from Western Australia. Uh, so many questions, but um, one that uh, is large in my life in terms of being a noticeable is having diversity in the housing supply in the public sector, whether it's community housing, which is a lot easier. But the, the tendency is to supply larger dwellings where the cost per square metre is, is less than, say, a, a studio home. But that's, so, and then waiting lists that go with that, which are horrendous in many jurisdictions. But the question I do want to ask is more related to uh, the various policies the different jurisdictions have in relation to requiring developers to have a percentage of their dwellings that they build, uh, residences that they build, uh, available to either the community housing sector or public and uh, uh, government uh, jurisdiction. So you mean through pro through procedures like includes residing? Or yes, and, and the idea of social mix or what was yeah. unfortunately called salt and pepper development. Yes. Okay, so um, South Australia has a particular uh, development. Yeah, we have in our planning system that um, looks to require 15% affordable housing, so it doesn't uh, specify the exact nature. The idea was when the policy was created, it would be 5% uh, purchase, 5% um, affordable uh, rental, and then 5% sort of deep need social housing. The reality is, is the market is focused on 15%, which is purchase, because that typically is the, um, the easiest thing of, uh, to do through that process. Um, again, I think there's an opportunity now with the growth in the CHPs within our state to actually have a conversation around more affordable rental as part of that process. Um, that's mandated in government land releases. Often it gets set aside by, by councils during planning processes, which basically is about trade that off for something else. It's, it's a bit like a conversation with the debt relief. I'm sure the state government would have agreed with the Commonwealth to do something else with that money. Often the you know, the same thing happens at the local level during planning processes when new developments put in place, notwithstanding our planning framework, which has got an inclusionary zoning requirement within it. Are there any other state with inclusionary zoning requirements? I mean, yep. Yeah, in, in Western Australia, uh, government land development includes 15% provision for affordable housing. Um, the real challenge, um, which creates an opportunity for NIFI uh, investment, is the uh, resourcing the capital to fund the construction and uh, acquisition of that stock. So uh, that's why in Michael's uh, example of, New of South Australia, um, leaning towards affordable home ownership is seen as the answer. It's the only way that the developers can get somebody to acquire the stock that's created. So um, we have another question, a couple of questions here. Um, just while we're doing that, I want to put to the panel the other aspect. I mean, that, you mentioned diversity of housing types and clearly old public housing stock, social housing stock is being redeveloped partly because of that, it's no longer what we need is one and two bedrooms, much more than family homes these days. But what about building adequately for a changing climate? Not only, um, not only in the social housing area, but requiring that of developers too. That actually that we need to now be building both for, um, for the purposes of healthy living for residents who live in this housing as, as the climate changes, but also to reduce carbon footprint of housing. How, how prominent is that as a concern? Not very. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually front of mind for everybody. When we sit that down and think about the housing typologies and the, you know, the build form, how can we make sure that we're actually focusing on affordable living as well as the affordable purchase and the other elements? I think the challenge comes back to that sort of starting point in that if you like the hierarchy of need, do it. If it costs slightly more to produce a house that's actually going to give someone an enduring benefit or house two people today um, instead, the, the, because of the pressure within the system, it often sort of folds back to um, essentially focusing on how do we maximise the amount of supply through that system. But at its core, I, would, I, I think I speak for everybody. Everyone is absolutely fixated on what is the, the, you know, the best form of supply. How can we actually think about all those elements associated with sustainability, with solar orientation, making sure we get the subdivisions the right way around, we've got appropriate thermal insulation. You've got those elements to ensure that houses can be, if you like, as natural as possible and as livable as possible without having to have uh, essentially mechanical intervention, which fundamentally just costs a lot um, with operations. 
But equally, one of the other things that comes to the affordable uh, living component is you can't build every house on the suburb. So again, it gets back to that concept that it may be cheaper to build a house 50 kilometres from the city centre, but it's not cheaper for someone to live there. And so it's continually balanced, and that's the tension that we face. Cheaper or better for the environment either, possibly. OK, one the last question here. Yeah. Uh, my name's Sophie. I'm from um, thanks to the speakers, and I'd love that the next iteration of this panel to be for the more female voices. <laughs> my question is that we've heard in this forum and in a number of others that the greatest barrier to funding social housing is political will. Um, so I would ask the panel, uh, I guess, what, what you do in your very influential roles to debunk some of the myths that are out there, and what would you recommend that we do as people who are very passionate about it to, uh, I guess, change the political discourse around funding housing? So the question is, what would you do to change the discourse around funding housing, particularly social housing, social and affordable housing, uh, given that clearly we need a political change if there's going to be and we need a change in public sentiment, I guess, if there's going to be the kind of funding we've been talking about this morning. And what should we do as well? Yeah. What should we do? I'll give this a go. This is our, this is our lives. You know, this is what we're trying to do on a daily basis, and to the extent that we can provide insight on that, we're good to go. I think, um, you know, part, partly this is um, all the evidence that we've seen, uh, I've talked before about you know, showing the pathways and making it, making it realisable. I also think fundamentally this is, and, and more and more of our positioning internally is, look at all the other boxes this ticks for government. Um, you know, nested within DHHS, the Health and Human Services, we see the same clients cycling through the system, through family violence services, through child protection, throwing up, showing up in our mental health services, and what's the kind of common element or the common platform for all those people? It's a safe and stable house. And if we're not getting that right, all the other investment and all the other effort, it, it, it doesn't get traction. And it, it's uh, sort of not, um, not uh, having impact it needs to have. So, you know, there, there's certainly a kind of investment logic there, like an almost like an early investment logic that we're, we're trying to build. A dollar in, in housing now can save you five dollars in services in five years' time. But there's, there's other boxes that housing ticks as well. Uh, you know, some of the earlier conversations in the day about education, employment opportunities. So, you know, I've, I've fallen straight into using a deficit frame and just showing all the little savings you can make in community services. If, the more that we can do to show the pathways for kids out of public housing and, you know, the fundamental platform that provides for them and their opportunities, I think that's a, that's a big win for government. Uh, equally, in Victoria, I'm going to come to this in the wrap up, but as an example, we've got the, the biggest um, transport infrastructure agenda that the state's ever seen, and, and showing how we can help housing tick the box of some of that urban renewal. Uh, the suburban rail loop in Melbourne will cut a sway through metropolitan Melbourne, it's where some of our housing affordability issues are most acute. And if we can do, you know, precincts and, and reimagining that area and get, get housing in there, it's a win for us and it's a win for that agenda, which needs to be more than just a rail project. So, you know, I, I think um, certainly let's move beyond thinking about it just as the stock to the people, and, and that's been acknowledged all throughout the day, but I think this is fundamentally a building block for a lot of what governments are trying to do. I think, I think there's a real opportunity to demonstrate to the government the quality of the uh, public sector that operates in this space and the quality of the community housing sector that operates in this space. Um, governments will fund uh, areas of government that, that perform well and that deliver quality outcomes. Um, we have the data, we know the volume of effort that needs to go in and we need to build confidence in the politicians about the quality of the people that work in the sector quality of outcomes they achieve and the impact that they have on the people that live in the accommodation we provide. So I think it's something that you all can do to help us. Yeah, we communicate every day with senior leaders across government and senior politicians about the efforts our staff put in and the value of spending another dollar in our sector. Um, you guys helping us to communicate the value of that and demonstrating to the politicians, the backbenchers, the quality of 
the sector and how well it performs in the delivering outcomes for people is critical. 